And um, happy Mother's Day. I know it's tomorrow, but um, sometimes we like to celebrate that a, a day early. So all of the mothers and and just the the ladies in our midst, we want to say um, yeah, happy uh, happy Mother's Day. And uh, we treasure you, and you're special to us. And uh, yeah, hope you have a wonderful feast. Maybe in bed tomorrow morning or something, men. Don't forget that. Um, but you're really, really appreciated. Um, it's nice to be in Wangarei and to, to see the sunshine. And um, we know it's always sunny up here. Um, I called one of our church members this morning just before coming in, and I said, "What's the weather like down there in Auckland?" He said, "Oh, drizzly, just like yesterday, and you know, kind of a morbid, in a morbid tone." And, and I thought, you know, it must get better, eh? The further north you come, it must get sunnier and more beautiful. And so it's, it's always like this, right? Always nice and sunny. Yeah, I thought so. Anyway, it's it's nice to be to be up here, and it's nice to um, see the second generation coming through, eh? Um, as Tony shared, we were at school together, and had some really good memories. And uh, just to see Tony, your kids down the front here, it's just amazing. And of course, Shane, I went to school with Shane, and congratulations. Uh, Claire and Shane on your new arrival. But uh, man, life goes on, doesn't it? And uh, the next generation comes along, then the next one. And um, we know that, that it's a sign eh, that Jesus is coming even sooner than we, than we might realize. But today I wanted to um, just spend a few uh, moments with you looking at kingdom living. And um, uh, as I've been kind of studying in the Word and, and really looking at, you know, what, God, what God's ideal for us is, I've been inspired by uh, His call to live for the kingdom. And so we're going to take a look at that uh, this morning. I know that we only have two hours together, so I'll try to shorten it a bit um, to an hour and a half. Um, but um, I thought we'd, we'd start off with by taking a look at some research that a couple of um, our friends who worked with Adventist Frontier Missions um, discovered as they were studying uh, Western culture. And I'm just, uh, I wanted to share this with you because I want to see if you, you, you might agree with this, okay? And of course, it's a generalization. But they, they discovered that um, when it comes to the Western culture, um, that there's kind of like a ladder that we like to climb, whether we know it or not. And um, it kind of goes like this. We go to school and get the best education that we can in order to get a good job, right? So far, so good. Get a good education so you can get the best job possible in order to make lots of money. That sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Make lots of money in order to have lots of assets, all right? In order to retire early. How does that sound? Oh, yes. See some, see some uh, twinkles in some people's eyes here. In order to retire early. In order to have more leisure time. In order to entertain ourselves. Isn't that kind of kind of an interesting thing that, they, that at least they came up with? What do you think? I'm talking, not, not talking about you now. I'm talking about Western culture out there. Does that kind of, kind of um, sum it up in a, in a general way? That the pursuit in the Western world, eh, it's not just to go to school, but it's to go to school so that we can make lots of money, so that we can get the good, sorry, so that we can get the good job and then get the lots of money. And it kind of goes up and up and up and up. And they discovered that the ultimate goal in Western culture, Western society, is to entertain ourselves. And when we can do that unhindered, we have arrived. And so here's this guy on the beach. Um, yes, I have arrived. <laughs> what do you think? How many would think that uh, this is, you know, in a very general sense, this kind of sums up the Western, Western pursuit? Can I see your hands? Just, just raise them. Okay, some of, you, some of you aren't so convinced. Well, that's what they discovered. It's very interesting. Th they also discovered this, that every culture has some kind of core value, just like they believe that the core value in Western society is really this, this pursuit of, of leisure time so we can entertain ourselves. Every culture has some kind of core value and some kind of pursuit. Now this is, um, pull it down, okay. 
You know, it's, it's very interesting when you go from church to church, all of the different mics they have, and um, invariably they don't fit me for some reason. I don't know if it's because my head's too big or too small, um, but this needs to come down, eh, Lou? Is that good? Okay, all right, a bit of rustling going on there. Um, but every culture has some kind of pursuit, all right, and um, some kind of ultimate goal. Uh, they also studied the culture... Uh, in Papua New Guinea. And uh, what they discovered was in Papua New Guinea, their pursuit was not so much to have lots of leisure time to entertain themselves. What do you think their pursuit was in life? Their ultimate goal. Anybody want to hazard a guess? What they discovered was that their ultimate goal in life was to have peace and to, to not be afraid of the spirits. Okay, and, and their whole pursuit, everyday pursuit, was to somehow appease the spirit so they could live in peace. And amazing. So it kind of went like this. They would learn the Christian way. This was, this was now those who they went to minister to. They, just, they saw this kind of happening even amongst, amongst them. They discovered that um, even many of those who were becoming Christians were learning Christ Christianity in order so that it would make God not get angry with them if they did the right things, so that he would be appeased and they could live a life free from fear. So they discovered that their pursuit in life was just freedom from the fear of angry spirits, God being angry spirit number one. And amazing, yeah? And so they discovered this that in, from, from their own personal experience. Uh, Dale Goodson, he had spent a few years out there in Papua New Guinea, and he had, he had studied with people, and sooner or later, they developed a big church, not a big church, but quite an impressive sized church there up in the highlands, and everything was going fantastic until he went on furlough. When he went on furlough back to the United States, he was there going around to churches telling all of these wonderful stories about all of these people getting baptized and coming to Christ, and everything was just fantastic until he arrived back in Papua New Guinea. What do you think he discovered when he arrived back? When he went back into his village... He discovered that as he was walking through the village, he'd been away for several months, that um, there were like little fetishes, you know, back over the doors of these different um, church members' houses. And uh, he discovered that they had actually sunk back into their old ways because this core value had never changed. This core value of trying to appease the spirits, God being Number, number one. And so they thought in order to appease him, we better go to church you know, on time. We better sing the three hymns. We better just do everything like we have been taught to do. And then we'll be in and we'll be able to live in peace. Isn't that amazing? So every culture apparently has some kind of core value that's driving them. Okay. Now, what do you think the core value back in the Bible times, in Jesus' time was? Ever thought about that? Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 6, because they also had a driving core value, a key motivator in their lives. John chapter 6 and uh, verse 14. John chapter 6 and verse, and verse 14. Now what's been happening here in John chapter 6 is that he has just fed the 5,000. And this is amazing. No one had ever seen somebody multiply the loaves and the fishes to feed 5,000 men, let alone children and, and, uh, and women. And so there's such a buzz. And look down at verse um, 14 of John chapter 6. Then these men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So after they saw this multiplying of the loaves and the fishes, they said, This has got to be the man. Then verse 15 says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to take, sorry, to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. What do you see coming through there um, in those two verses? Now I'm in trouble. It might be the beard. What do you reckon? Maybe I should. Uh... Testing. Okay. Thanks, Lou. All right. Um, what do you think the core value there is that, that's coming through? Why did these people, why were they interested in Jesus? They were interested in Jesus 
for what he would do or could do for them. Okay? So in other words, and what could he do for them? He could be their king so that he could liberate them from who? From the Romans. So what was their motivating force in their life? Freedom from the Romans. And here was a man who could give it to them on a platter. I mean, imagine going out to battle with this man. All of our troops who were, who were wounded, he could just heal. He could feed them, yeah, without any kind of uh, you know, expense on the government. I mean, this guy's just going to be amazing for us. So their, their goal was somebody who could, who could help them achieve their aims in life. And that was freedom from the Romans. Yeah? So this is their motivator or their key, their key goal in, uh, in life. Now, what do you think Jesus had to say about that? Well, it's interesting. If you look down to verse 26 in verse 27, after Jesus uh, gets out of there, he didn't want to be crowned king uh, in that way. He goes to the other side of the lake, and uh, people soon discover that he's gone. They follow him. And once they catch up to him, notice what he says to them. John 6, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, Not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were what? And were filled. So what Jesus here is saying is this. He's saying, listen, the reason why you're so interested in me is not because of the signs that point to me as the Messiah. You're not interested in a Messiah. You are interested in what kind of physical gain you can get from me. Does that make sense? Yeah? So he's kind of like this. Pulling back the veil of their heart and exposing their underlying motives. That's what I love about Jesus. eh? He can just go straight to the heart. And and notice what he's saying though now. Verse 27. He says, do not labor for the food which perishes. In other words, don't make that the driving force of your life. But for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So what Jesus is saying here is this. He's saying, listen, guys, I want you to to, to see the, the, the whole world, life, in a completely different way. I want you to change your, your, your key value or your core value in life from, from freedom from the Romans and what you can get to actually being a part of my kingdom and who I want you to be. Does that make sense? So he's doing like a, a flip on them as far as what they should be, should be searching for. So let me ask you a question. What core value is driving your life? What's the key motivator hey, that gets you up in the morning? And is that key motivator, that key core value, in line with God's purpose for your life? Isn't that a good question? What's God's purpose really then for our lives? I want to uh, invite you to uh, um, turn with me to what I believe is God's core value for us. And you can look at it here on the screen if you don't have your Bibles either way. Um, Can we say this together? Matthew 6 verse 33. Let's say it together. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Don't you like that? I mean, Jesus hits a six right there with that one verse. He's saying, listen, if you've ever wondered what the purpose in life is, what your purpose in life is, it's right here. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I mean, what a, what a mission statement that is. You know, we have churches with that, our mission statements on the back wall and companies. What about this one, eh? <coughs> Excuse me. For, for us as Christians. Now, if Jesus is asking us to seek first the kingdom of God, what does he mean by the kingdom of God? How many of you have read in the Bible all of the parables that talk about the kingdom of God? It's, you know, Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like this and that and this. I mean, all over the place, right? I mean, it's really kind of hard to, hard to get our handle on what the kingdom of God really is. Here's a few more. Uh, the kingdom of God is like a man who finds a pearl in the field and sells it. Sorry, sells all that he has to purchase the field. Here's another one. When Jesus comes in his kingdom, talking about the kingdom of God. I've even heard down in... Um, uh, Manukau, uh, what's his name? 
Tamaki, it's a Bishop Tamaki. He wants to build the kingdom of God. Okay, and they're laying plans for that kingdom of God everywhere. You hear about it. But what was Jesus actually meaning? I want you to just take a look at these two verses. Um, f- for instance, Matthew 4, 17. Jesus said this. Well, the Bible says this. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. So Jesus here is talking about the kingdom of heaven, this thing that we're trying to define now. And what is he saying? Is It is at hand hand. But notice this other verse, Luke 19 verse 11. This is on the heels of a parable that Jesus gave to to instruct the people that the kingdom of God was not imminent. And notice what this says. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So in this story, Jesus is saying, wait a second, the kingdom of God is not here yet. But in the previous verse, he says the kingdom of God is at hand. So what's the deal when it comes to the kingdom of God? You see the, see the dilemma here. I want to suggest to you this fact. That if we are going to live God's purpose for us, for that to become our core value, we need to understand what he's talking about. What does he mean by this kingdom of God? And so we're going to spend just the last few minutes together talking a little bit about this kingdom of God. Well, Jesus, of course, meant what he said. In one sense, the kingdom had arrived already, but in another sense, the kingdom wouldn't come until the Son of Man returned in the cloud. What Jesus was talking about when it comes to the kingdom of God was two phases, the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. Can we say that together? The kingdom of grace. The kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. Two kingdoms that Jesus said he was wanting to to set up. The first is a spiritual kingdom and the second is the physical kingdom. Both are just as real, just as powerful, and just as essential. The first kingdom, the kingdom of grace, prepares people for the second kingdom, the kingdom of glory. Does that make sense? So Jesus kind of talks about two aspects to his kingdom here, and that's the key to unlocking this apparent dilemma there. And by the way, this is what the Jews got confused over. They kind of mixed up the kingdom of glory with the kingdom of grace. They thought that Jesus was right then and there setting up the kingdom of glory. But in actual fact, he was there to set up first the kingdom of grace. Does that make sense? This will become so relevant as we, um, as we continue here. So, now I need um, your help. Can you give me some help this morning? I hope so. Um, I need some people to, um, to read a, a verse for me. I don't know, Lou, if uh, it's possible to have a roving mic, or is that too, too hard to set up? If not, you can maybe just shout it, shout it out. Um, but we're going to do just a little, little Bible study together on this kingdom, yeah? And it won't take long. And the first question I'm going to ask is, when did the kingdom of grace, we're going to focus on this first kingdom, kingdom of grace, that he said had arrived. When did the kingdom of grace begin? Could someone look up Matthew 4 and verse 17? Matthew 4 verse 17, and if you have that, just raise your hand or say, say I, I got it or something. Matthew 4 and verse verse 17. We want to ask this question. When did the kingdom of God, sorry, the kingdom of grace begin? Matthew 4 verse 17. Somebody have that for us. I want you to stand and uh, speak nice and clearly. Matthew 4 verse 17. Verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. All right. Some versions say the kingdom of heaven uh, has, is near, right, is at hand. So in, us, in answer to the question, when did the kingdom of grace begin? You tell me. When did it begin? S- say it nice and loud. At his ministry. All right. Kingdom of grace starts... When Jesus started to proclaim the kingdom, eh? his, his ministry. And of course, we see Jesus going around preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing, etc. Now, 
Second question, what is the kingdom of grace? And if somebody could look up Romans 14 verse 17, or perhaps you could read it from the screen here, what is the kingdom of grace? Do we have another volunteer um, for that? Romans 14, 17. Anybody? Right down the front here, um, Lou. What is the kingdom of grace? For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. All right. So what does Romans tell us about this kingdom of grace? Is it some kind of geographical territory? Or is it some kind of, you know, palace somewhere? What does he say? He said that the kingdom of grace is talking about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, the kingdom of grace has to do with what goes on in here, right? And in here, and what God is doing in here and in here. Does that make sense? This kingdom of grace. No wonder the Bible talks about the kingdom of grace being like a mustard seed and, you know, growing in your heart and, and things, like, things like that. It's actually very interesting that when Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount, he was laying down the principles of this kingdom of grace. And instead of, you know, writing out a constitution for a, for a geographic nation, he was laying down the, what, what people need to be like, eh, to, be, to be citizens of this kingdom. He was doing it there on that hillside, giving the Sermon of the Mount, laying down the constitution for the spiritual kingdom. So it's a kingdom of, of grace that's in our hearts, in our minds. Now, here's another one. Where is the kingdom of grace? We've kind of answered that one. But could someone read this one? Mark 12, verse 34. Mark 12, 34. Anybody? All the way, all, all the way over there. Mark 12, 34. Where is this kingdom of grace? Yeah, now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Ah, all right. So where did Jesus say this kingdom of grace is? He says, you're not far from the kingdom of grace. What he's saying is this, it's not a geographical kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom that takes place in our hearts and in our, in our minds through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Here's another one. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God comes to you. And last of all, this is the most clear. He says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed the kingdom of God is within, within you. A profound Profound statement. Kingdom of God is within us. Two more really quickly. How do we enter the kingdom of grace? Someone read this for us. John 3 verses 3 to 6. This is a long one. John 3 verses 3 to 6. Anybody? You know, you're all so gracious up here in Mongaray, you know that? You're always wanting the other one to speak first. That's fantastic. Someone at the back there or maybe someone over here? Yep. John 3, verses 3 to 6. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old, can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water in the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is his Spirit. Amen. All right. So how do we enter this kingdom? Through some kind of passport or, um, you know, ethnic, ethnicity? How do we enter it? The spiritual kingdom. Through the spiritual rebirth, eh? 
This regeneration that only the Holy Spirit can do in our hearts. A new heart, a new mind. That's how we enter this kingdom. Yeah? And last of all, who is the kingdom of this? Sorry, who is the king of this kingdom? Anybody want to read that one? Maybe the sister over here. Did you raise your hand before? Right there. Who is the king of this kingdom? He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So who's the king of this kingdom? Jesus. So has this kind of helped us get a grip on this kingdom of God, this kingdom of grace that He had come to set up? Yeah? This thing that sometimes can be so nebulous. Let's just have a summary here, a rundown, just so that we get it clear in our minds. This kingdom of grace eh, began with Jesus' ministry. It is a new spiritual life imparted by the Holy Spirit. It happens in our heart and lives. Jesus makes us experience this kingdom through his Holy Spirit, and Jesus becomes king of our lives. I want to suggest to you this morning that when Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God, what he was saying was this, Seek this right here above everything else in life. You know, obviously you may be a plumber, you may be a fisherman, you may be whatever God has called you to. But this here has got to be the framework that we do all of that in. Does that make sense? Make this the driving theme pursuit of life. I want to, uh, let me just back up before I move on from this. I just want to suggest this. It's important to understand what the kingdom of God is. Because if we don't know what it is, we'll never know how to seek it. And Jesus said that seeking this kingdom should be our greatest aim in life. You know, um, I believe for a lot of us, Satan has done a number on us and tied our hearts to the world's values instead of Christ's values. It reminds me of a, a story of a gang of thieves who went into a uh, late one night to a jewelry store. And in the store, there was all kinds of treasures and expensive th items and not so expensive items. And what they did was when they, when, they, when they managed to break into the store, instead of stealing stuff, they did something different. They went around carefully, carefully, and they took the price tag off the most expensive item, and they placed it on the most inexpensive item. And they took the most inexpensive item, price tag, and they placed it on the most expensive. And they did that with all of the items there in the store, shop. Well, they were so good that, they, um, that when they left, uh, the next morning, the shop owners had no idea that anybody had even been in there. Uh, that was until people started to bring these precious, valuable items up to the counter, and they were getting them for like pennies on the dollar. I mean, they're like, I, didn't, I never knew that was so cheap. And uh, after a few of these uh, things had been sold, the, the shop owners, you know, put two and two together, and they discovered, you know, something's wrong here. And then they discovered what had happened, that the thieves had come and switched the price tags, and that made something that was very valuable appear very cheap, and something that was very cheap appear very valuable. Well, I believe that Satan has switched the price tags in this world, and he has tricked us, a lot of us, into putting so much value on things that really aren't that valuable, and a lot of value on things that, that are. Here's a, um, here's a thought. Sometimes this can happen in the church as well. Many of us take the name of Christian, but still value the things of the world. Our religion is comprised of knowing the right things, believing the right doctrines, and doing what we feel Christians should do, but that's it. And sometimes our religion is driven more by what we can gain than by Christ. I want to share this very provocative um, quote here from A.W. Tozer. This guy's not a Seventh-day Adventist, but a, just a really insightful guy. 
This is what he says here. He says, Behind the activities of the non-religious man and the man who has received the gospel without power lie the very same motives. Interesting, eh? So he's saying that the non-religious man and the religious man who doesn't have the power have, uh, lie the very same motives. An unblessed ego lies at the bottom of both lives. The difference being that the religious man has learned better to disguise his vice. The man who has received the word without power has trimmed his hedge, but it is a thorn hedge still and can never bring forth the fruits of the new life. Yet such a man may be a leader in the church and his influence and his vote may go far to determine what religion shall be in his generation. Isn't that, that that's kind of ouch, right? I mean, that kind of makes me go, ouch! <laughs> because what he's saying here is this, is that, is that it's not the name that we take. Christian or non-Christian, but it's what actually, what's experienced in the heart. And it's possible to even be a Christian and take the name, but still be the same kind of person that everybody else is out there in the world, yeah? In other words, we can trim the hedge, but it's still a thorn hedge all the same. It's a powerful, powerful, provocative quote there. But the Holy Spirit wants us to switch the tags. He wants to switch the tags upside down again so we begin to value and live what's really important to life. And I just want to suggest here this morning, when we allow him to do this, it will change the way we look at the world. Have any of you ever worn pink-tinted or blue-tinted or purple-tinted glasses? Anybody? No? I don't, I don't think I have either. Okay, so some of us have here. It, what do you see when you put on glasses that are tinted? The whole world looks different, right? If it's a purple set of glasses, everything looks purple. If it's pink, everything looks pink, blue, everything looks blue, right? It depends on the glasses, the lens that we are looking through. And that's a great description of when it comes to the kingdom of God. When we seek first the kingdom of God, like we've discovered, yeah, Jesus is calling us to. It should shade everything that we see in life. Everything that we do, everything that we, that we say, everywhere that we, that we go. So just in closing here, let me ask you a question. Are you seeking the kingdom of God? Are your priorities arranged around Jesus and his kingdom? Is your time arranged ultimately to serve Jesus and his kingdom? Are your finances, your resources arranged to ultimately serve Jesus and his kingdom? Are you guarding your health so that you can serve Jesus and his kingdom? And are you choosing to live for Jesus and his kingdom? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, today we've heard your call, the call of Jesus, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Lord, we've seen just a little bit about what that means this morning. This beautiful kingdom of grace. Lord, that you have invited us to become a part of, to seek first, so that we can be prepared for that kingdom of glory when Jesus comes in the clouds. Lord, we've seen that, that sometimes the, the tags can be switched. We can begin to value things that um, aren't really that valuable. And we can think things are worthless that really are the most precious things in life and in light of eternity. Father, today we want to, if the price tags have been switched in our hearts, in our lives, we, wanna, we want you to, to rearrange those, those tags so that we truly value what you value and we truly seek what you are calling us to seek. Lord, teach us in our own personal experience what it means to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and then to be blessed as we see you kind of arranging everything else uh, once we've made that critical, critical uh, commitment. So bless each one here, Father, uh, in only the way that you know how, the only way, in only the way that you um, know we need. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the invitation to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And all these things will be added unto us. Uh, Lord, we, um, we're excited to see, to experience the plan that you have for each one of us. And Lord, we have seen your hand working in our lives. And we're excited. That gives us courage to know that you'll continue that work um, from here to the end. And so, Father, help us to, as we continue to journey through life in whatever sphere you've called us to, to, to make seeking first your kingdom our utmost priority. Teach us how to do that, Lord. Sometimes we don't know how to do that in, in the context of, of where we live or where we work or, or our family situation, but we know that you can, you can teach us and guide us in that. But, Father, we pray today that, um, that you would be number one in our lives that your righteousness would be in our hearts so that when Jesus comes again, we can say, hey, look, this is our God. We love him, and now we're ready to live with him forever. That's our prayer, Lord, today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.